case, you just divide by rho B C P A C D. Get a squared unit. Okay? Alright. So this is a, a differential equation. So this is the whole model, right? Because we've already used the first relationship in here that describes how the temperature changes the function of time. Okay. So in principle, if I, for, from the standpoint of control, if I were to, for example, change the Q or inlet temperature as a function of time, you could predict what the temperature coming out of the tank would do as a function of time. Okay, by solving the model. So this is an initial value problem. Obviously, I have to give you an initial condition to solve this, the initial temperature, you know, some temperature at time zero, for example. I have to give you the physical properties, rho and CP. I have to give you what I call the operating conditions. What are the volume? What is the flow rate? What is the inlet temperature? What is the Q? And then you would integrate that equation to find the temperature. Okay. Would that be easy? It should be. Because it's a, this is a linear differential equation. It's non-homogeneous, right? You can see that because there's a term over here that is, makes it non-homogeneous. Actually, there's two terms, that term and that term. But you could solve this. It's, it's quite, quite simple to do. Okay? Now, unlike in... Um, so in this class, we're going to have two ways of solving this equation. We're never going to um, solve it in the time domain. Okay? So we're going to, if we want to do the work analytically, we're going to use something throughout this course called the Laplace transform. Do you guys get that in differential equations? Okay. Do, do you, maybe I asked you this last time, and I don't know if I remember, but we've created supposedly now a differential equations course that's taught from the same book as the book you had for 361, but maybe that was done after you guys did it, or you guys took that course. Okay, all right. <coughs> so in principle, that should give you a better background, and a more uniform background, because what we found in the past was, if I asked you, did you see Laplace transform, some people would say yes, and some people would say no. So I'm assuming at this point, if somebody says it, it's true for everyone. I hope that's true. All right. All right, so this, this is a, an example that we use a lot. So if we don't choose to use Laplace transforms, um, we'll just take this thing into MATLAB and solve it. Okay? We won't be integrating uh, in the time domain so much in this class for reasons I'll explain. Okay, now, so I always ask these questions. You think I'd remember them, but I never do. So did you, who taught you guys kinetics? Was it Dan Howard? Schiffman, okay. And so did you do the exothermic CSTR? No. Okay. Um, so we, we covered it um, in 361, and we'll talk about it now. It's a, it's a nice example because it's pretty simple, but it's a nice example of a nonlinear system that actually is, its behavior is quite um, difficult in practice. So. If you go into industry, you will find chemical reactors are um, some of the more challenging unit operations to control and operate, and especially if they're highly exothermic, okay, because they can, um, do, did you guys talk about ignition? Ignition means where a reactor takes off, this finally explodes, that's always, that's never good, okay? So, and you, you'll be able to see why in this example. So, here's, uh, so I'll, I'm going to go through the derivation, so that's no problem. So here's our example here. It's the simplest reaction. I guess it's not even an isomerization reaction, but it's just A goes to B. Okay. So A is the reactant, B is the product. So in the feed stream, we have pure A. Okay. It's at some volumetric flow rate, some um, composition, and some temperature. Okay. We put it in this reactor, we react it. It generates a lot of heat, so we have to remove the heat by um, having, in this case, we have a cooling coil that removes heat from the system. The reactor has some, in this case, constant volume V, constant density rho, and it's at some temperature T. Okay. And coming out of this reactor, unless you have 100% conversion to some mixture of A and B, um, you can see in the picture here, I've already told you, it's the same flow rate coming in as out. And that's because it's constant density, constant volume, which are assumptions you'll see over here. It has some uh, composition of A. Hopefully that's less than the composition you put in, because A is supposed to be consumed to make B. And it has some temperature T, which is almost certainly higher than the temperature of the inlet stream, because you're generating heat. Okay. <coughs> so here's the assumptions. Constant volume. Yeah, I got that one. A is pure A in the feed, perfect mixing, no heat losses. Constant physical properties. In this case, we're going to have a couple other physical uh, parameters that describe the system. One is heat of reaction, delta H. You should be familiar with that, I hope. Um, and also
also u, that's an overall heat transfer coefficient, because we have to describe the heat transfer here. Um, and a big assumption here is that this, this cooling jacket's at some comp constant temperature, right? So if this was some refrigerant, so I don't know if you guys know about refrigerant, the most common one you think of is cooling water, but other ones are like liquid propylene and things like that you can use for cooling. But you might expect if you put this fluid through this coil, it's going to heat up, right? It's going to come out hotter than it went in, right? So we don't want to deal with that complexity because then we'd have to write an energy balance on the coil, and we don't want to, okay? So the way, what thing this would make the most sense is if I put, um, if you had a phase change, right? So if the, if the fluid changed phase, it would actually, it would take up a lot of heat, but it would have a constant temperature. But this is an approximation, this makes the, the problem simple. All right, now we're gonna use these two things which I call constitutive relations. By constitutive relations, I don't know, you've probably not heard that term before. It means these are not fundamental equations. They're things that we use to describe the system. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm telling you that the reaction rate has a form that looks like this. Okay. So you should have seen this. It's been nothing surprising to you. Exponential depends on temperature. I'm going to assume it's linear function of the concentration of A. Okay. And uh, E is the activation energy, and um, K naught is the frequency factor, it's usually called. And then I'm going to tell you the rate of heat transfer looks like this. Okay? It's the difference between the temperature of the coolant and the temperature of the reactor. It's an area. The area here would be the area for heat transfer. right? And then there's some overall heat transfer coefficient. I assume you've seen heat transfer coefficients as well. Okay? All right. So we put this all together. And so now I'm going to have three sets of equations. So do I need a mass balance? Essentially always. Do I need a component balance? Sure, it looks like it, because I have A going to B. Okay. So because this is an irreversible reaction, I can write the equation for A or B. Right? I, have, I can do an overall mass in A, overall mass in B, or A and B. I, can't, I shouldn't do all three, though, because they're redundant. Right? So in this case, I'm going to do overall mass and a balance on A. Do I need an energy balance? Uh, sure looks like it. All right. So that's, that's why I'm doing these three balances. The first balance is already implied in the picture, but it's, a tip, it's the exact same thing we did before. If the density is constant and the volume is constant, then the inlet flow will equal the outlet flow. So that's that simple. Nothing new there. All right. Component balance. Okay. So the way I've written this equation, um, these will be like mass compositions, right? So this will be something like... Um, your favorite units, um, I don't know, something like gram per liter, okay? That, that's, the, that's the units of CA and CB. It can be any, it's, it's mass per volume, that's, that's the point, okay? So if I take, let's say I'm, so I'm doing a component balance, I need to know how much A comes in, how much A leaves, and how much A is consumed by reaction. Okay. So this is the amount of A coming in. So that's a volumetric flow, right? So that means it's something like liters per hour. I'm just making up the units here, right? So it's, it's mass per time. That's the main point, mass per time. Okay. That's the amount of A flowing in the inlet stream into the reactor. Here's the amount of A flowing out of the reactor. That's the concentration in the reactor. It's well mixed. That's what flows out. That's the flow rate coming out. So the same as the flow rate coming in, by the way, but whatever. And then we have reaction. If you were to look at the reaction rate expression, I'm going to try not to go back and forth between slides. Like, people don't like that so much. <laughs> so I'm going, to, I'm going to try to avoid that. You just have to remember what it looked like. If you looked at the equation for the reaction rate on the previous page, that will have units of, um, let's take a look here. So it's going to be per volume, and then it's going to be It's going to be like grams uh, per liter per time, or something like that. Okay. So this this reaction rate here is going to have units of mass per volume per time. Okay. So if I multiply, that's why I'm multiplying times volume because it's on a per volume basis to begin with. That gives us that gives me a term that's mass per time, which is what I need. Okay. And that's all I've done down here. So there's the volume, and then this term here is the reaction rate I gave you on the previous page, okay? All right, so N minus out plus 
balance generation, also known as minus consumption. And then I need the accumulation term. Okay. So I want to know how much A is in the reactor. So I take the concentration of A and multiply times the volume of the reactor. That's, that's mass of A now. Okay. Take the derivative, that's mass for time. So that's, the, that's how A is changing in the reactor as a function of time. The reasoning here being obviously that if, if, I would, if I put more A into the reactor than is leaving and is consumed by the reaction, the concentration of A in the reactor will increase as a function of time. Otherwise, it will go down. The only time the concentration of A will be constant in the reactor is if these terms balance each other. Okay? The amount of A I put in is the same as the amount of A withdrawn and consumed. All right, so to get down to this stage, just take the V out of the equation right there because it's a constant. You can combine these two terms, right, because qi equals q, just call it q, and then just plug in the r there. So there's one equation. Okay, that's the component balance. All right, for the energy balance, same kind of thing. You have accumulation in the minus out plus generation. In this case, generation has kind of two terms, if you will. So this is the uh, amount of enthalpy coming in in the inlet stream, right? So this is like BTUs per hour. Flow rate of the inlet stream, temperature of the inlet stream, relative again to a reference temperature, no different than the one I showed you before. This is the rate at which energy is flowing out of the system. Again, that's the flow out. Um, that's the temperature out. Again, state function, so relative to a reference temperature. Um, there is energy being created by reaction, right? That's the delta H. This is the normal notation, is that an exothermic reaction is negative. So to make this term positive, I have minus delta H. That makes that a positive number. Okay. So if we look at the terms there, so we've got R times V. So that's going to be uh, that's going to be like energy per unit time. Is that right? Energy per unit time, and then. No, no, that's not right. I got to write it on the board. Okay, so we've got what? Oh, where did that term go? I'll put it over there. Okay. So we've got delta H. I don't, I'm trying to figure out what the units are because I don't remember. Um, we've got volume. So let's just call that liters, for example. And then I told you the reaction rate was like, um, what, mass? Help me remember here, people. What did I say it was? Reaction rate. We'll look at the previous equation. It has the same units. Well, you can see it has the same units as so V here. So it's like, so it's like mass. I don't know. It's called kilograms per volume per time, I guess. Right? And then the delta H will be something like joules um, per mass. This is, what, this is what I was trying to figure out. What are the units of the delta H? It's mass. It's, it's energy per, per mass. <coughs> the principle that of a boom, 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 you get energy per time. That's what we want. Okay. You don't have to worry about this in a problem because I would give you all the units. But, but it, it is, well, I should say you wouldn't have to figure out the units of joules per kilogram, I would tell you this. But it is a good idea to look at the terms in the equation and make sure they have the right unit, like energy per time, so you, didn't, so you don't make a mistake. All right? Okay, so there's N minus out. This is a generation term. And then we have heat removal. Okay, because Q is being removed from the system, it's negative. And so that'll have removal, okay? So those two, those are all the terms on the right hand. So then we have to have the accumulation terms. So we have to know how much enthalpy is in the fluid in the tank. Okay. So again, MCP delta T. That's MCP delta T. That gives you units of like joules. Take derivative joules per time. Energy per time. Okay. So again, this is something that I think the more you see, I don't know how comfortable you are with it now, but the more you see it, the easier it will become to, to understand. So then I just did a little simplification here. What I did, I pulled the row V, C, P, F, because they're all constant. Again, you have derivative of this quantity now, but T ref is a constant, so it's derivative of zero, so you're just left with this. I gathered these two terms together because I identified that WI and W were the same, so I could cancel the two ref terms, and then I decided, for whatever reason, to rewrite the W term as rho times Q, because 
W is rho times K. Okay? And then it looks like this term, the delta H term, all I did was substitute the R in right there. Okay? And then I put the term in for Q right here. So if you look at the Q term, that should be a negative term, right? Hopefully the coolant is at lower temperature than the temperature of the fluid, so that whole term should be negative. It should remove heat. All right. Okay. So if we look at this equation, or this model, you can see we have two equations here. We have one for the composition, right, concentration of A, and one for the temperature. Um, so I probably have a lot of these comments on the, previous, on the next page, but it's easier to look at them now. So if we look at these two equations, the first thing we notice is these two equations are coupled together, right? Like this involves temperature, and this one involves concentration of A. That means you have to solve them simultaneously, right? The other thing we notice, this model is noticeably nonlinear, because, so, how, either, how do I explain nonlinear? So either something's linear or it's not, or it's not, it's not linear. It's, so if, in order for the equation to be linear, you'd have to be able to write it like this, okay? Um, dCA dt equals some constant, call it A1, or just call it A, fine times concentration of A plus B times temperature. That's a linear equation. You could also have a constant C floating around. would be fine. Okay? You'd have to be able to write the temperature equation like this. A linear function, a new constant, let's call it B, times concentration of A, another constant, times temperature, another constant floating around, maybe. If you cannot write the equations like that, they are not linear. Okay? So that means on the right-hand side of any equation that's linear, all you can have is constants times variables or just constants themselves. Can't have two variables multiplying each other. Can't have one over a variable. Can't have exponential of a variable. Can't have log of a variable. Okay, so if you can't do this, model is not linear. And I mean, it's pretty clear from the form of these equations you're not going to be able to do that. You know, you've got this exponential term involving temperature. That thing multiply CA. So this, this is noticeably nonlinear. Okay. So to solve this, um, you have really one option, and that's take this, take this model to the computer and solve it in MATLAB. Okay, that's really the, the only real option. Okay. I'll teach you um, in a few weeks, in principle, we can linearize this model, come up with a linear model that will look like that, and work with that. Okay. But we won't worry about that right now. Do you guys have any questions? In a class of 85 people, I find there's very few questions. All right. All right, so then we have, so I think I already said all this. So we have two differential equations. Um, these equations are nonlinear coupled together. This is an initial value problem. So in order for you to solve this problem, I have to tell you, what the initial temperature is and what the initial concentration of A is, and then you integrate this, these two equations simultaneously forward in time, numerically, on the computer. Okay? Um, for problems that we're talking about, so the difference, when we did 361, we'd have differential equations. Sometimes time was the independent variable, and sometimes some spatial coordinate was the independent variable. You remember like the plug flow reactor? We'd have Z, the length along the reactor would be an independent variable. That's a differential equation, but it's not dynamic. So for all the models we're going to talk about in this class, time will be the independent variable, and we'll end up with differential equations in time. Okay? We'll call that usually a dynamic model. Okay, so this is just some simple degrees of freedom analysis. It says we have, we have a variety of unknowns. Okay? So the, so for example, here are all the things that you may not know. You don't know the concentration of A on these of the temperature. I have to tell you, right, what the flow rate is, what the inlet <coughs> concentration is, what the inlet temperature is, what the coolant temperature is. And these things, in principle, could be functions of time. Okay. So one of the values of using the Laplace transform is if I give you a differential equation and I tell you, I want you to compute these two things, but I want you to do that where the inlet temperature changes in some form that I give you, it's much easier to do that with the Laplace transform than any other method. Now, obviously, for this example, this is not particularly germane because the model is not linear, and Laplace transform only applies to linear models. But I'm telling you, one of the powers of the Laplace transform and this whole methodology I'll be teaching you is you can calculate, you can do something like this. So, 
usually when we solve differential equations in like 361, you had some model, let's call it M, and you wanted to calculate something like Y of T, right? And, I, and the input in some sense was the initial condition, right? What is Y at time up to zero? And then you would calculate, solve this model and get Y of T. But in this class, we'll be much more interested in this problem. I tell you how some input changes with time, and I want you to tell me how the output changes of time as a result. Okay? Like for the liquid flow system I showed you, I might change the um, inlet. Like you go back to the simpler um, liquid level system I showed you. I might, here might be the inlet flow rate as a function of time, and I tell you, what if I increase that like that from some value to another value at some time? Okay? I want you to tell me what does the level look like? Okay. I want to know what that looks like. And that's going to be a problem that's very much easier to solve in the Laplace transform than in the time domain. So that's why we'll be that's why we'll be introducing that. Okay. okay. So but no, notation here is these things are inputs. So I might take any of these particular variables here and tell you that's an input for the problem, and I'm going to tell you how it changes, and your goal is to tell me how the two so-called state variables, the two dependent variables in differential equations, change as a function of time. If I say something second order, that means it has two state variables. It's described by two differential equations, just another way of saying order, you know, dimension of the system. Okay. Um, OK, so we have one more example, which is this one, which we did in 361. I don't remember exactly what detail we derived. But um, so this is just a biochemical reactor. So I know a subset of you are in the bio option and are probably, is 592 being offered this semester? For those that do that? OK. So you'll see a lot of this in a lot, much more detail than I'm covering it. But we'll use it as a nice example that goes beyond traditional chemical engineering. So what are we doing here? Um, I don't remember where I stole this picture from, but it's not the greatest picture. To, in, in really, but what we're doing here is we're growing cells in this reactor, and we'd like the cells usually to produce some product. It might be some commodity chemical, like a fuel, like ethanol or propanol or something. Or these cells might make some therapeutic protein or something like this. Okay.